barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So finally, inshallah ta'ala, uh, I've been personally anticipating this seminar for a very long time and I've been working on the material and um, you know, just looking into this entire subject in a very deep manner. And subhanAllah, when we look at it, you know, there are a few qualifications I want to make before we even start going into the history and the virtues of Masjid Al-Aqsa. For one, we are not suggesting in any way that a masjid is holier than a human life. And that's something that I think a lot of people miss the point of many times, that we should be concerned about Palestine because of Masjid Al-Aqsa. But the fact of the matter is that one innocent life, one Palestinian life, in fact one Burmese life or one Syrian life or one, uh, one life of someone in Somalia is far more precious than Masjid Al-Aqsa on the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet tells us that even the Kaaba, which is holier than Masjid Al-Aqsa, even the Kaaba is not as honorable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as, as the life of a believer, as, a, as the honor of a believer, as the blood of a person. And so when we're talking about this subject, this sanctuary, this Aqsa, that has such a, you know, a, a high place in the sight of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and in the sight of his companions and in the sight of the believers, and in fact, every prophet of God that came before him, we're talking about it to connect ourselves spiritually to this masjid. I could give a talk about the many injustices of, 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 is, of the Israeli regime, uh, the Israeli government towards the Palestinian people. We could talk at length about the political situation. But what I feel like is that we're almost missing this spiritual connection to this place. And that's a very powerful component to have in this discussion. And I would argue that even the Palestinians don't have that connection anymore. That the call for Palestine, the call for Masjid al-Aqsa tends to be an extremely nationalistic call. But when you talk about a man like Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah ta'ala, Salahuddin didn't love Palestine because he was a Palestinian. This man wasn't connected to Masjid al-Aqsa because he was an Arab. In fact, he was Kurdish. He wasn't even an Arab. And the way that his biographer describes him is that the weight of Masjid al-Aqsa on the heart of Salah al-Din was heavier than mountains. I mean, it could flatten mountains. The passion this man had for that masjid, the way that he dreamed of seeing it liberated one day, and the way that he rallied the entire Muslim world around this cause. And one thing that, that I find very powerful, and it's going to be very tough for me to not focus on Salah al-Din in this seminar uh, because I'm fascinated by his biography, but obviously that's not the topic. Uh, one thing about him and one of the misconceptions that we have about his era is that when Jerusalem, when Masjid al-Aqsa was conquered and ransacked and desecrated in a way that it has never been done before, the Muslim world actually didn't flinch. For 50 years, in fact, there's a book uh, named The Crusades Through Arab Eyes by an author by the name of Amin Ma'luf. And he says in this book, he actually documents the historiography of the Muslim world in the Crusades era. For 50 years, Salahuddin was just writing letters to people, writing letters around the Muslim world to convince them why this is so important, why Al-Aqsa should become the rallying call, why Al-Aqsa should unite the, the hearts of the believers all over so that they could come together for something that's so precious to them. And he made it, he made it important to them. And SubhanAllah, that's what we're trying to do here. Though I'm, not, I, I'm in no way trying to do what Salah al-Din did, or at least in that level. But the idea of connecting our hearts to Masjid al-Aqsa, to making dua for it, to recognizing that this is the one call that the Ummah can unanimously rally around because it is that important to us. And obviously when innocent lives are being taken anywhere in the world, it's a call for the entire Ummah. But if you look around the Muslim world, historically speaking, even in the modern day you know, Arab Spring or what was supposed to be the Arab Spring, Palestine always becomes the rallying call. And Masjid al-Aqsa in particular becomes the most important focal point for the believers when we discuss it from a spiritual aspect. So let's talk a little bit about the history inshallah. And you might be fascinated because you might think that Al-Aqsa was built maybe by a prophet of Bani Israel. Maybe it's something that arose you know, from the time of Solomon, Sulaiman alayhi salam or Ya'qub alayhi salam. But the Prophet ﷺ was actually asked by Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. He said, I asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, ayyu masjidin wudi'a fil ardi awwal. O Messenger of God, what masjid was built on this or was constructed on the face of the earth first? So the Prophet ﷺ says, al-masjid al-haram. Al-masjid al-haram in Mecca. I said, thumma ay? I said, then what? He said, al-masjid al-aqsa. And I asked him, O Prophet of God, kem baynahuma, how many years were between the construction of Masjid al-Haram in Mecca and Masjid al-Aqsa 
in Palestine. The Prophet ﷺ said, Arba'una sana, only 40 years. And so there are a few things we can take from that. Number one, who built the Kaaba? It wasn't Ibrahim ﷺ, it was actually Adam ﷺ, right? This was the first place of Adam ﷺ where he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's in Mecca and the angels built it. Ibrahim ﷺ rafa'aha, he raised the qawa'id, he raised the foundations, but it was already built, it was already constructed and made a sanctuary in the time of Adam salam. And so the scholars say if we look at it from that perspective, then either Adam salam also built Masjid al-Aqsa, or maybe his son Sheath. There are some narrations that say his son Sheath salam built Masjid al-Aqsa. So we're talking about only 40 years between the first Masjid and Masjid al-Aqsa. And we also find that just like Abraham, just like Ibrahim salam raised the pillars of the Haram in Mecca, he did the same thing in Jerusalem according to the strongest opinion. So it was either him or his son Ishaq, Isaac, or his son Jacob, Ya'qub But Ibrahim salam goes to Mecca, he builds the Kaaba, he raises the foundations along with his son Ismail salam, and this becomes the focal point of Ibadah. Then he goes back to Jerusalem and he builds another sanctuary with his son Isaac because we know Ibrahim settled in Palestine eventually. And Ibrahim salam passed away in Khalil and he actually is buried in Khalil. And so he builds another sanctuary with his son or he instructs his son to build a sanctuary. And so you have Ibrahim salam building one sanctuary with his son in Mecca, another sanctuary with his son in Jerusalem and these two masjids make up two thirds of the holiest masjids in the world. So subhanAllah, you have Abraham having his hand in both of these masajid and dedicating both of them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Al-Aqsa, Al-Aqsa actually means the furthest masjid. And the reason why it was called Masjid Al-Aqsa is because it is the furthest masjid away from the Haram or it was at the time. So it, the Prophet ﷺ referred to it that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to it that way. And according to, you know, Abrahamic, according to the Judeo-Christian tradition, Jerusalem is the place where Ibrahim salam raised his son Ishaq, he raised Isaac. It's the place that was settled by the original tribes of Bani Israel. And one thing that obviously we disagree with them on, they also say that it's the place that Ibrahim salam was to sacrifice his son Ishaq, was to sacrifice Isaac salam. Obviously to us it's the Prophet it's Ismail salam in Mecca. So there's a lot of history that takes place there and because the main thing that I'm going to do inshallah is I'm going to focus on the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu and what it meant to the Prophet peace be upon him in his generation I'm just going to give you guys a rundown of how Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala mentions it in the lives of all of these prophets Allah mentions it as the refuge of Lut alayhi salam the Prophet Lot after Abraham his nephew Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says wa najaynahu wa lutan ila al-ard allati barakna fihi lil alamin that we, uh, we rescued him and those that were with him to the, to the ground, to the part of the earth that we have blessed. Barakna fihi. We have put blessings in this part of the earth. And so Allah mentions here that this is a place that is blessed, it's sanctified. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't just do that with Lut alayhi salam. He does it when He speaks about um, Sulaiman alayhi salam, when He speaks about Maryam alayhi salam. Anytime he speaks about this land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that it is a blessed land. And we find this uh, with Sulaiman alayhi salam, he says, Al ardi lati barakna fihi. And again with the Prophet, sallam, he says, Al Masjid al Aqsa ladi barakna hawla. That not only have we blessed Masjid al Aqsa, we've blessed the land around it. And there's a beautiful reflection here by Imam ibn al Jawzi rahimahullah. He says that Abraham sanctified Mecca. Ibrahim alayhi salam sanctified Mecca. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sanctified Medina. But Allah took it upon himself to sanctify Al-Quds. He sanctified Jerusalem because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes the barakah in that land to himself over and over and over in the Quran. And this is frequently mentioned uh, throughout. And it's interesting because what we see happening historically is that after Jacob, Ya'qub alayhi salam settles there with his children, we have the story of Yusuf alayhi salam where Palestine is struck by famine and Yusuf alayhi salam is in charge of Egypt and then Ya'qub alayhi salam who's also known as Israel 
migrates with his children and his, you know, all of his entire family to Egypt because at that time, the thing to do was to leave Palestine and go to Egypt for safety. And subhanAllah, the way that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nas, that days go by and things change. Things change dramatically. At one point, this will be a place of safety. Another point, this is a place of chaos. You know, in the story of Yaqub alayhi salam, you have a people fleeing Palestine to go to Egypt for safety. And then years go by, and in the story of Musa alayhi salam, what do you have happening? People fleeing Egypt to go to Palestine for safety and prosperity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala switches things, and this is his sunnah with the earth. That sometimes the east will be successful and in a place of prosperity. You know, there was a time where people in Europe used to send their children to the Middle East to study there. Sometimes this is a place of prosperity in the West and people send their children here to learn and become you know, educated so they can be prosperous in their homelands. And that was the same case from an economic and political perspective with Palestine, especially what we see with Palestine and Egypt. Then you have Moses, Musa alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that as Musa alayhi salam, so now we're coming back to Palestine. Ibrahim establishes Jerusalem with his son Isaac and his grandson Ya'qub, they move on to Egypt. Now we have Musa alayhi salam coming back. And as they escaped Egypt, Musa alayhi salam tells Bani Israel that Ya qawmi thkuru ni'matallahi alaykum idh ja'ala feekum anbiya wa ja'alakum muluka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Musa reminded his people that Allah has made you prophets or he's made amongst you prophets and kings. That you are a people that Allah has given a lot of favor and a lot of strength. And all they had to do was enter Jerusalem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set the stage for them. To the point that Musa alayhi salam, he's got his people. He just saved them from Pharaoh. He just split the sea for them. Right? It's all set for them. They should not be afraid of anything else. If anything, after the miracles they've witnessed from Musa alayhi salam, these people should be convinced that anything is possible. But whenever Musa Ali, when Musa alayhi salam says to them, Ya qawmi tkhulul arda al-muqaddasat allati katab Allahu lakum, O oh my people, enter into the holy land, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. And why is it Muqaddasa? Muqaddasa means holy. And what it means according to the scholars is Mutahira, it purifies. And what that means is anyone who goes to Jerusalem and leaves it, leaves purified from his sins. SubhanAllah, that's the actual meaning of the word. So he says, Udukhulu Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. Just enter, you don't even have to do anything. Udukhulu. All you have to do is march in. And there were 600,000 people with Musa alayhi salam, a very capable group of people. They've just escaped persecution. Now you're going to prosperity. And as soon as he says that, let's go in, what did they say? They say, Ya Musa inna fiha qawman jabbarin. They said, wait, they've got some scary people in there. They've got a mighty army in there. We can't deal with those people. We can't mess with them. Allah just told you, udkhulu, just enter. And they said, wa inna la nadkhulaha hatta yakhruju minha. We're not going to go in until they, they get out. So, you know, you and Allah, figure it out, get that army out of Jerusalem, and then we'll go in. And Musa alayhi salam, I mean, he's looking at these people like, what does he have to do for these people? You know, he has done everything for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them all these miracles. They were 600,000, and out of 600,000, you know how many of them were willing to go with Moses to Jerusalem? Two. Qala rajulani. There were only two people that feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, we'll go with you, O Musa. So Musa alayhi salam, he calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, I can't do anything with these people. لا أملك إلا نفسي وأخي. I can only control myself and my brother. I can't do anything with these people. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do to them? He forbids them from Jerusalem for 40 years. For 40 years, they're left wandering in the desert, waiting for this opportunity, waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them another go. And that's why we have all these ayats of Bani Israel wandering in the desert because they did not go to Jerusalem as Allah wrote it for them. And Musa alayhi salam is desperate. And this is what's called Sunnat al-Istibdal where Allah replaces a group of people because they were not worthy. The Prophet ﷺ said not a single person from those who worship the calf would be able to enter Jerusalem. Meaning Allah gave them 40 years because by that time they all would have died and it would have been their children. You guys were not worthy for it. You were not fit for it. You turned away from that blessing from, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so now you have to wander in the desert and wait for that opportunity to come to you again. Now obviously, who suffers the most? The Prophet, Musa alayhi salam, because of the foolishness of his people, 
has to wait in the desert for 40 years and he has to die in that exodus. And Rasulullah and the reason why I'm going into some detail with this is because the Prophet he actually tells us about Musa السلام, how he felt about Jerusalem, how he felt about Al-Bayt Al-Maqdis. In one, in one narration, Musa السلام, made a dua. He said, Allahumma inna kakhtartu min al-an'am al-daniya wa min al-tayr al-hamama wa min al-buyuti bayta ayla' wa min ayla' bayt al-maqdis. He starts mentioning, oh Allah, you've chosen Amongst the birds, you've chosen this, and amongst this, you've chosen that. And he says, and amongst the homes, amongst the countries around the world, or amongst the settled nations, you've chosen Eilat, which was Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, you've chosen Masjid al Aqsa, you've chosen Jerusalem, you've chosen Al Quds, uh, Al Baytul Maqdis, the sanctuary. So Musa alayhi salam could not enter into Masjid al Aqsa. You know what the Prophet says? He says, Moses was very emotional about this. And SubhanAllah, the scholars say that if you feel bad that Allah has forbidden you from entering into Al-Quds, realize that even Musa السلام, was forbidden to the point that his last request to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is an authentic hadith, سَأَلَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُدْنِيَهُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ الْمُقَدَّسَةِ رَمْيَةً بِحَجَرٍ He asked Allah as the angel of death came to him, since I can't get into Jerusalem, let me be just a stone's throw away from it. Let me be able to just see it, subhanAllah. And according to the Bible, it's Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo, you can actually see Jerusalem from it. That Musa السلام, went there and he just stared at it. And his heart longed for it to the point that even though the Prophet وسلم, said Musa made Hajj, Musa has been to Mecca. His heart longed for Al-Quds. He wanted Jerusalem. And the Prophet وسلم, says, and this is also an authentic hadith, he said, if, you, if I was there right now, I could show you where his grave is. You know, the grave of Moses is not marked. He said, I could show you exactly where he's buried. He said he's buried beneath a road under a red dune. SubhanAllah, just outside of Jerusalem. Because his heart longed for it and that was his last request to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, time goes on. Joshua comes, Yusha alayhi salam, the Fatah, the young man of Musa alayhi salam. And he is the only person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped the sun for. And what that means is Yusha was going into Jerusalem to conquer it. And it was Asr time. And he looked to the sun and he said, Anta ma'mur wa ana ma'mur. You are commanded by Allah and I am commanded by Allah. And he asked Allah to stop the sun, to allow it to not set so that he could carry out with the conquest of Jerusalem. And the Prophet said, it happened in six days that Yusha alayhi salam was able to bring Jerusalem in six days. Now what's the story of Bani Israel constantly? They take it, they become wicked, they lose it. So you find this cycle over and over and over again. Yusha alayhi salam conquers it, they're prosperous, and then they become wicked, they start cheating with the law, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes them to be destroyed and expelled. So then you have what Allah mentions of Talut, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints Talut now to come back to Jerusalem and take it once again. And from the army of Talut, you have Dawood alayhi salam, King David. And David takes Jerusalem and he, and he defeats, of course, Goliath. Dawood alayhi salam defeats Goliath. And for 33 years, Dawood alayhi salam prospers in Jerusalem. Now, his son, Sulaiman alayhi salam, takes over. And Solomon is the most important king in the history of Jerusalem. Why? Because you always hear the temple of Solomon. Sulaiman alayhi salam, and this is now about 933 years before Isa alayhi salam. So 933 years before Christ, Sulaiman alayhi salam comes into Jerusalem. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said he built about 40 masjids. So it wasn't just Masjid al-Aqsa. He builds about 40 masjids throughout the earth. And as he builds Masjid al-Aqsa, and I want you guys to realize, so I'm just going to clear this from now. Masjid al-Aqsa is that entire rectangle, that entire sanctuary, it is humongous. That is actually all Masjid al-Aqsa. The Dome of the Rock is the center of it. So that entire compound is Masjid al-Aqsa. So Sulaiman alayhi salam builds that all out. The, the original Temple of Solomon, what's known as the Temple of Solomon, right? The first, the first time that Masjid al-Aqsa would be built in that, in that caliber, right? He builds it throughout. And the Old Testament has a lot of detail about how lavish and how elaborate the masjid was when Sulaiman built it. But we don't know if it's actually true or not. But the point is, is that Sulaiman السلام, builds this masjid throughout and he invests his heart into it. 
And the Prophet ﷺ says he does something very beautiful at the end of it. Sulaiman ﷺ, when he built Masjid al-Aqsa, Rasulullah ﷺ said he asked Allah for three things. He made dua for three things. The first one, hukman yusadifu hukma. He asked Allah for sound judgment, judgment that was in harmony with his judgment. Then, wa mulkan la yanbaghi li ahadin min ba'di. He asked Allah for a kingdom that was customized, that would not be replicated by anyone after him. A special kingdom, domination. Then he asked Allah for a third thing, and listen to this. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa alla ya'tiya hadha al masjid ahadun la yuridu illa salata fihi illa kharaja min dhunubihi ka yawmi waladatu ummu. That no one will come to this masjid and pray seeking nothing but the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the only intention they came was just to pray in this masjid, except that they would leave from that salah purified from sin the way that their mother gave birth to them. That's the reward of Hajj, right? Sulaiman alayhi salam asked Allah that if anyone comes to Masjid al-Aqsa and prays two rak'ahs or comes with the niyyah of salah, just the niyyah of prayer and nothing else, then let them leave completely purified from sin like the day their mother gave birth to them. And Rasulullah said, Allah gave him the first two, and I ask Allah that He gives him the third as well. So the Prophet basically, Amman ala du'a'ihi, the Prophet basically said, Ameen to his du'a. May Allah give him the third thing he asked for as well. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu chases after the Prophet sunnah and rewards. Ibn Umar used to go all the way from Medina to Jerusalem just to pray to rak'ahs in Masjid al-Aqsa. And Ibn Umar would not even drink a cup of water from Jerusalem just so he doesn't break that niyyah, just so he doesn't break that intention, that I'm only going there for salah, just to fulfill that dua of Sulaiman alayhi salam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approved. So Sulaiman builds Masjid al-Aqsa about 930 years before Isa alayhi salam. He establishes it and you have all sorts of legends and movements and things tied to this Temple of Solomon. So I'm not going to go into detail now. But the Freemasonry movement, for example, ties itself to the Temple of Solomon. The, the Kabbalah movement ties itself to the Temple of Solomon. You know, sorcerers tie themselves to the Temple of Solomon. Why? Because the accusation is that Sulaiman salam used jinn and used magic to control his kingdom. And he, held the, he, he hid these tablets under his throne. And when he died, the shayateen, or they, they went and retrieved these tablets and they realized how Sulaiman was really running his kingdom. So you have all these satanic movements that attach themselves to the Temple of Solomon. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا That Sulaiman did not disbelieve, it was the shayateen that disbelieved. The shayateen that led people to connect themselves to Sulaiman alayhi salam in such a wicked way. So you have all these movements associated to Temple Mount. Even again, the, the, the Zionist claim to Masjid al-Aqsa is Temple Mount, right? That this is the Temple of Solomon, that Masjid al-Aqsa, the Dome of the Rock, is built on top of the Temple of Solomon and we have to get it back. It's all tied to the Temple of Solomon. Now what happens after Sulaiman He dies, they become wicked once again. And when they become wicked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about the destruction of the Temple of Solomon, the first destruction of the Temple of Sulaiman and that's in the 6th century before Christ. So about 590 years before Isa alayhi salam, the Babylonians invade Jerusalem and they destroy the masjid altogether. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends them prophets and brings them back and Allah gives them another chance. So they go back to Jerusalem. Bani Israel is given another chance at Jerusalem. And in the year 352 before Christ, they establish the second temple. So this is the second time they're building the temple of Sulaiman or the masjid. Uh, at that time. And in this time, you've got to understand that for the, the next 400 years, think about what happens in Masjid al-Aqsa. Zakaria alayhi salam makes dua in Masjid al-Aqsa for Yahya alayhi salam. And Allah grants him Yahya alayhi salam. It's a blessed place to make dua. So yeah, Zakaria makes dua in Masjid al-Aqsa for a son in his old age and Allah grants him Yahya alayhi salam. This is the same masjid where Maryam alayhi salam was tucked away in her mihrab, in her, in her, in her own dedicated space of worship where she would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah would send all sort of miracles, sort of mer sorts of miracles to her. This is the same masjid that Yahya, John the Baptist alayhi salam, gave khutbah in. All of this happens in the next 400 years and of course Isa alayhi salam, this is the place of the preaching of Jesus peace be upon him. Now what happens? Bani Israel tries to kill all of them, right? Kills the prophets, 
fights against them, Allah destroys their temple once again. When they killed Yahya alayhi salam, Allah promised them the destruction of the temple. So 70 years after Isa alayhi salam, the temple is destroyed once again. Now that back history background is to basically put you in the mood now for what the Prophet ﷺ is encountering historically speaking. In the year 312, in the year 312, Christianity expels Jews. Constantine and the Christians expel the Jewish people from Jerusalem altogether and they made it illegal for the Jews to live in Jerusalem for hundreds of years. All the way until Umar al-Khattab so the Christians would expel the Jews at that time, and obviously there was enmity between them. And for 300 plus years, they would not be allowed to enter into Jerusalem due to that persecution, and they persecuted the Jews anywhere they found them, right? And it was, you know, there were Jewish revolts and rebellions in different parts of the world, but there is a war that's taking place between the Christians and the Jews pretty much around uh, the world. Now let's get to the Prophet When the Prophet was born, he says that because it starts from his birth that a light came from the stomach of his mother. When the Prophet ﷺ was born, there was a nur that came out of Amina. And what did it light up? The Prophet ﷺ said, it showed Busra min ard sham It showed Busra from the land of Asham. And Busra is modern day Dara'a. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those people. They are one of the most persecuted groups of people in Syria. So the Prophet ﷺ, the light comes out as he's being born and it highlights the palaces that were in Busra at the time. And Ard al-Sham, the land of Asham, is Palestine, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. That entire area is Asham, and it was the most prosperous place in the world. It's where the Romans uh, resided, right? And as the Prophet ﷺ is being born, before he says a word, Allah is showing that this part of the world will come to the Prophet ﷺ, that his message will reach this part of the world. And Busra, subhanAllah, just out of prophecy, Busra was the very first city that was conquered by the Muslims from Asham. The very first city that, that came to the Muslims. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he cried when Busra came to the Muslims because he remembered what the Prophet ﷺ said, that that's what lit up when he was born. The Prophet ﷺ, as he becomes a messenger of God, he's commanded to pray towards Masjid al-Aqsa, though he's never been to Jerusalem. Now you think the Prophet ﷺ was standing in the Haram in Mecca and turning his back to it? No, he would place himself in a way that the Kaaba was in front of him while he was still facing towards Masjid al-Aqsa. So he always prayed towards Masjid al-Aqsa in his Qiyamul layl in his night prayer, um, in his, in, in, you know, in, in his uh, daily devotions, in the morning and evening prayers that Allah legislated. The Prophet ﷺ, he faces Masjid al-Aqsa. And then you have another interesting hadith, and this is all in Mecca now. The Prophet ﷺ, he says that as I was sleeping, I saw the light of Amud al-Kitab. And Amud al-Kitab is the pillar of the book, meaning I saw the light of the Qur'an coming from under my pillow. And he said that light traveled and my eyesight followed that light until it reached Asham. And the pillar was established there. So the Prophet ﷺ sees the light of the Qur'an coming from under his pillow and his sight follows until Asham, and it's placed in the middle of Asham. And the Prophet ﷺ says, "Ala wa inna al-imanu ida waqat ida waqat al-fitna tu bisham." He said, "Verily, faith, when there are when there are times of fitna, trials, and tribulation, you will always find iman in Asham. You'll always find the people holding on to their faith in Asham. That Allah would establish the religion in that area. He would establish the religion in Asham. Now comes the journey, obviously, of Al-Isra' al miraj and this is where the Prophet ﷺ is going to see Masjid al-Aqsa for the first time. Now you have to understand that the Prophet ﷺ, as he's, as he's there, he is, uh, you know, he's sleeping in the hijr of the Kaaba. Just imagine this sight. He's asleep in the hijr of the Kaaba. If you, you know the semicircle in the Kaaba, he's actually sleeping inside of there. And Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet ﷺ. And he opens the heart, he opens the chest of the Prophet ﷺ and he takes the heart of the Prophet ﷺ and he pours inside of it al-iman wal-hikmah, faith and wisdom, reassuring the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And he's about to take the Prophet ﷺ on this amazing journey. And it's not just a spiritual journey. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhana alladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawla. لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Glory be to him. Subhan alladhi asra bi abdi. Glory be to him. And obviously, Subhan here, and some of the Mufassirin, they said that's the first proof that this was a physical journey, right? Because Subhan is used in amazement that Allah took his servant of his in one night from Al Masjid al Haram in Mecca to Al Masjid al Aqsa, and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed it and as well as its surroundings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then took the Prophet ﷺ and allowed him to ascend where he would be shown the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A physical journey and spiritual journey of the Prophet ﷺ from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. And Ibn Abbas ta'ala anhu says about Masjid al-Aqsa. Why does Allah say, Barakna hawla? We've blessed everything around it as well. Because Ibn Abbas says there is not an inch in the entire city of Jerusalem except that an angel has stood there or a prophet has prayed there, or a prophet is buried there. Not a single inch in Al-Quds, in Jerusalem, except that an angel or a prophet stood in that area. And Allah is going to take the Prophet ﷺ to that place. And Jibreel ﷺ brings Al-Buraq, right? And Al-Buraq, I know, you know, if you've seen those Persian drawings and stuff like that, Al-Buraq is this, he's not a, it's not a pony, it's not this animal with wings. All right, there's no winged horse, there's no pony, there's nothing. It's not what you see in those drawings. It is an animal that the Prophet ﷺ says that is so fast that with every, it's, a, it, it's a, a regular animal, but with every stride, it is to the end of your eyesight. So every time Burak takes a step, it is to the end of your eyesight. That's how fast it is. And th this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created cheetahs as well as turtles, right? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create whatever animal He wants and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give them whatever speed He wants. You're not going to say, well, that doesn't make sense because, well, how does a cheetah's speed make sense, right? How, how does a hummingbird's speed make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense. But that's the ajaib, that's the amazement of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jibreel alayhi salam, when he brought al-Buraq forward for the Prophet sallallahu to ride on, Al-Buraq got anxious and Jibreel alayhi salam, he calmed Al-Buraq down and he said, there has never been a more honorable man that has, that, has, that has ridden on top of you, never. And the ulama say that that's a proof that other prophets have, rid, have, have been on Al-Buraq as well. And some of the scholars say it was the animal that Ibrahim alayhi salam, took from Jerusalem to Mecca. When Ibrahim alayhi salam, came for Hajj. So now the Prophet alayhi salam, is going from Mecca to Jerusalem, Allahu Alam, it could be the same animal, but even if it's not, it's still an animal that has had other prophets on it as well. And the Prophet وسلم, as he travels upon Al-Buraq with Jibreel alayhi salam, you have to realize Allah could have taken the Messenger وسلم, directly to the heavens. He didn't need to go to Jerusalem, right? If there wasn't something special about Jerusalem, why didn't Allah just take him immediately to the heavens? But there's something about Al-Quds. There's something about, something about Jerusalem. The Prophet وسلم, says, لَمَّا انْتَهَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسِ قَالَ جِبْرِيلُ بِإِصْبَعِهِ He said when we got to Bayt al-Maqdis, when we got to Jerusalem, he said Jibreel alayhi salam, he simply pointed at the wall. He pointed at the wall. فَخَرَقَ بِهِ الْحَجْرَ وَشَدَّ بِهِ الْبُرَاقِ When Jibreel just pointed at the wall, it split. And he tied the buraq to it. SubhanAllah, and it's an authentic hadith. SubhanAllah, that the Prophet is witnessing these amazing things with Jibreel alayhi salam. And then Jibreel alayhi salam took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam inside Masjid al-Aqsa. Now according to the strongest narration, first the Prophet sallallahu alayhi prayed two rak'ahs by himself. He enters into Masjid al-Aqsa and he prays two rak'ahs by himself. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, رَفَعْتُ رَأْسِي I raised my head and I saw all of the Prophets of Allah gathered for me, standing there waiting for salah. Can you imagine? He raises his head and he sees Ibrahim alayhi salam standing there. He sees Adam alayhi salam there. He, says Sulay he sees Sulaiman alayhi salam who built it. He sees Musa alayhi salam standing in Al-Masjid al-Aqsa who didn't have the opportunity in his lifetime to be, to, to be in that land. And they're all waiting for the Prophet salam, to take his place, to lead them in salah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was shy. So he says, فَقَدَّمَنِي جِبْرِيلُ حَتَّى أَمَمْتُهُمْ So Jibreel took my hand and he put me in front of them until I led them in salah. SubhanAllah. He led all of these prophets. And this is the only time that all of the prophets have been gathered in salah. The only place where this has ever happened. And it was there that Jibreel alayhi salam presented the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with a glass of wine and a glass of milk and gave him the choice. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam chose 
al-laban. He chose milk, to which Jibreel alayhi salam commented, Alhamdulillah, ladhi hadaka lil-fitra. Law akhathta al-khamra, ghawat ummatuk. Alhamdulillah, Allah guided you to your natural goodness. If you would have taken the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. He says, thumma araja bi Jibreel, then Jibreel ascended with me. So then it was from that place that they started to ascend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, subhanAllah, this journey, and, and you know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but alhamdulillah, if you look at the story of Jibreel, which alhamdulillah, finally now, uh, is on, is on Bayna TV, because a lot of people have been asking, when's it going to go online? When's it going to go online? If you look at the amount, you know, that the, that the closeness that the Prophet Sallallahu has with Jibreel alayhi salam, as they're going on this journey, Jibreel walking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi through it, Jibreel pointing to the, to, to the wall and, and splitting it. And by the way, the, the place of Burak is the opposite side of the Wailing Wall today. Okay, it's literally the opposite side. There is a little, uh, there is a little chain link there. It's not the place where Jibreel a.s. Uh, tied Al-Burak, but it's in that area where actually Masjid Al-Burak was established. Right? SubhanAllah, I mean, he's going with the Prophet Sallallahu and he's taking him through this entire journey. And the Prophet Sallallahu on this night of Al-Asra and Mi'raj, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shows him his greatest signs. And Jibreel explains to him all of these things, paradise, hellfire, the different prophets of Allah. He meets them. He sees a Dajjal. He sees all these things on that day. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reassures the Prophet Sallallahu as he goes on this incredible journey with Jibreel Alayhi Salaam. Now when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came back to Mecca, this is a beautiful narration. He says that, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي فِي الْحِجْرِ Prophet said, I, I remember standing in Al-Hijr, the same place where he was taken on that journey. And he says, وَقُرَيْشْ تَسْأَلُنِي عَنْ مَسْرَايَةِ And Quraysh came and started to interrogate me. And they started to ask me about my ascension. He says, فَسَأَلَتْنِي عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ مِنْ بَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسِ لَمْ أُثْبِتْهَا They started to ask me for such little details about Jerusalem, about Masjid Al-Aqsa, and about that area. And I was having a hard time recalling. Why? I mean, there was a lot going on on that night. <laughs> you know, the Prophet ﷺ is not going to notice all the little details about where this was and where that was. He was kind of occupied by the sight of all of those Prophets of Allah and on all the other amazing things that were happening. So the Prophet ﷺ says, I was standing there. He says, فَكُرِبْتُ كُرْبَةً مَا كُرِبْتُ مِثْلَهُ قَتْ he said, I was struck by anxiety that I'd, I had never been struck by before. The Prophet ﷺ got nervous. He got vexed. He started to sweat. He didn't know what he was going to do. He explained to them the basics. He explained to them the things he saw on the way. But they're asking him for like locations of doors and locations of this and this and this and that. And listen to what he says. As he's standing in front of the Kaaba, he says, فَرَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ لِي أَنظُرُ إِلَيْهِ Allah raised Jerusalem, Al-Quds in front of me. Allah put the image of Al-Quds in front of him. And I'm looking at it. مَا يَسْأَلُونِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَنْبَأْتُهُمْ بِهِ They asked me about anything about Jerusalem. I was able to tell them what was there and I'm looking at it. Allah raised Al-Quds in front of the sight of the Prophet ﷺ. And he answered the most detailed questions about Jerusalem, making the people that were taunting him look pretty silly. The idea was to humiliate the Prophet ﷺ, but he's telling them about the smallest details of Al-Quds, and Allah is showing it to him as he's standing in front of the Kaaba. SubhanAllah. Then they make their way to the Hijrah, and they go towards Medina. Now when they reached Medina, they would worship towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa was still their Qibla for about 16 or 17 months. The Sahaba say it was 16 or 17 months that we continued to pray. Uh, towards Masjid al-Aqsa. Al-Bara radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, when we got to Medina, one of the signs, and this is actually something very beautiful and powerful, one of the signs of the, to the people of the book that this was indeed the Messenger of Allah was that he was facing towards Jerusalem. They knew that this wasn't something that was made up. They were shocked by that. You know, the Jews in, in Medina were shocked that the Prophet ﷺ was facing in the direction of their sacred temple, of, of Masjid al-Aqsa, their sacred space as well. To them, that was a sign that this was indeed the Messenger of Allah. So they were very pleased by that, and they were very taken aback by that, that this new religion is really not a new religion as, at all. They're facing towards the same direction as us when they pray. Now for 16, 17 months, that's what they were doing. Then as they were praying in the middle of, uh, in, in the middle of Salat al-Dhuhr, in Masjid Banu Salima, they're in the middle of Dhuhr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the change towards Al-Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. So that's why it's called now Masjid Al-Qiblatayn, the Masjid of the two Qiblas, because they switched their direction from Jerusalem towards the Kaaba, towards Masjid Al-Haram. 
And the, and the first salah that was prayed in full towards Masjid al-Haram was Salatul Asr in the Masjid of the Prophet in, in Masjid al-Nabawi. Now the Sahaba when that happened, they, they went out and they started calling to all these little groups of Muslims, stop praying towards Al-Aqsa, start praying towards Mecca and so on and so forth. But then they got nervous. They came to the Prophet and they said, Ya Rasulullah, what about those people that died that used to pray towards Masjid al-Aqsa? What about all of our prayers that we used to do towards Masjid al-Aqsa? Is all of that gone? So the Prophet ﷺ, he asked Jibreel alayhi salam, or he, he brought the concern to Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel came back with an ayah of Qur'an in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah will not let your faith or your prayers go to waste. All the good that you've done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has documented it and recorded it. Now the question becomes, why didn't Allah just make the Qibla the Kaaba in the first place? And there is a lot of wisdom in that, that the scholars mention. Number one, that the Prophet ﷺ is the only Prophet of Allah that has ever prayed towards both Qiblas. And this is a sign that he is the messenger of all of mankind. The seal of the Prophets, be they from the lineage of Ishaq, or from Ismail salam, from Bani Israel, or from the Arabs, whoever it is, the Prophet ﷺ is the final messenger and he combines all of that within him. SubhanAllah, he's the fulfillment of the dream of his father Ibrahim salam from both directions, in both ways. So he prays towards both Qiblas that were established by his father Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that was, that was an honor for the Prophet sallallahu It's the ultimate fulfillment, that Allah combined it within him. And you know, the companions after the Prophet sallallahu passed away, they could have described themselves with many descriptions. And I'm, this is something that, it, it was sort of, it was something subtle, but it struck me at least. And I don't know if there's something there, and if, or, or if I'm just digging too deep into it, but it really struck me. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he lived a very long life. He lived longer than most of the companions. He was a kid when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina. He served the Messenger ﷺ, then he lived for a very, very long time. Many people are tabi'een because of Anas. Like that's the only companion they got to meet, right? Because he lived so long. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu described himself in his old age he says that there is no one who has prayed towards al qiblatain la yabqa mimman salla al qiblatain ghayri there is no one alive on the face of the earth today who had the honor of praying towards both qiblas except for me he could have described himself in many ways he could have said no one from the ansar who initially received the prophet sallallahu alaihi is still alive no one from those who made hijra or received or you know whatever it is but he chose to distinguish himself by being amongst those that allah honored to have been able to pray towards Masjid al-Aqsa as well as Masjid al-Haram. Now even though the Qibla was changed, and this is the most beautiful part of this all. And by the way, I'm going to tell you guys this from now, because so that when you start dozing off and sleeping, the very last narration that I'm going to share with you in this class, in this webinar, will give you goosebumps. It, gave, it gives me goosebumps at all. So that's for everyone that's on the webcast. Don't you dare leave, right? Because the very last narration brings this all together. The fact of the matter is that when the Qibla changed towards Masjid al-Haram, there was still a deep connection that the companions had towards Masjid al-Aqsa. And there are so many narrations where the Sahaba are still connecting themselves to it at the order of the Prophet ﷺ. This was an attitude. They still loved it. Now obviously you have the technical part. The Prophet ﷺ says, الرِّحَالُ إِلَى ثَلَاثَةِ مَسَاجِدِ There are only three masjids in Islam that you should undertake a journey to. Either Masjid al-Haram, or Masjid al-Nabawi, or Masjid al-Aqsa. These are the only three masjids that you should make a point to travel and undertake a journey to go to. But there's actually a few interesting hadith. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu says that one time we were sitting, and he says, تَذَاكَرْنَا وَنَحْنُ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أَيُّهُمَا أَفْضَلْ Al-Masjid al-Aqsa or Al-Masjid al-Nabawi. We were sitting around the Prophet ﷺ and we were wondering which one of these masjids is better? Masjid al-Aqsa? or the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, which one's better? So the Prophet ﷺ says, Salatun fi masjidi hadha afdalu min arba'i salawatin fi. He says, listen, praying in my masjid, from a rewards perspective, salah in my masjid is four times greater than praying in masjid al-Aqsa, right? From a salah perspective. But then the Prophet ﷺ continued and he says, wala ni'man musallah. He said, but what a beautiful place to pray it is. And he says, wala yushikanna an la yakuna لِلرَّجُلِ مِثْلُ شَطَنِ فُرُسِهِ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ حَيْثُ يَرَى مِنْهُ بَيْتَ الْمَقْدِسِ خَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا This hadith is powerful. Because the Prophet ﷺ is almost acknowledging that it's going to be a very long time where we're going to be uh, deprived for, from Masjid al-Aqsa. 
that this is going to be a situation that many Muslims will be in. The Prophet ﷺ said that what a beautiful and blessed musalla it is. He said there will come a time that it would be more beloved to a person to just have a, the space, a, a space that occupies, a piece of land that occupies the same amount of space that his saddle would occupy. Right, just his rope, the thing that he ties his horse with. Just to have that small piece of land to where he can look at Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Prophet ﷺ says, and that would be better for him than the entire dunya and that which is in it. That to just have that small piece of land, subhanAllah, this is blessed land. To just have that small piece of, piece of land, not where he can pray in Masjid al-Aqsa, that he can just look at it, would be more beloved to him than having the entire world and everything in it. The Prophet ﷺ is basically validating our emotions. That the Muslims would be barred from it, but they would love it so much that that would be their dream. They're living in palaces and mansions around the world, but they're still crying at night because they want to be able to see Masjid al-Aqsa. They want that opportunity to be able to go to Masjid al-Aqsa. That this is the heart of the believer. So that significance still stayed uh, with the companions to the point that they used to make oaths that they would pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, there are various hadith in that regard. Ibn Abbas who said that once a woman fell sick and she said, if Allah gives me a cure, I will certainly go pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. I'm going to make it a point to go pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. And when she recovered, she started to make her preparations to go out to Masjid al-Aqsa. Now at that time, it's a place of war. Persians and Romans killing each other. It's not safe for a woman to go make her way. It's not safe for anyone to go make their way to Masjid al-Aqsa. But uh, she was about to leave and Maymuna, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, she found out and uh, she told the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ says that you can pray here instead. That prayer here is a thousand times better than any other masjid in the world except for Masjid al-Aqsa. So just pray here instead, uh, except for Masjid al-Haram, I'm sorry. So just pray here instead. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to make it easy for her, but this was her desire. This is how the companions felt about Masjid al-Aqsa. In fact, imagine if you were there on the, on the conquest of Mecca. Now these people came from Mecca, they were run out of Mecca. And Masjid al-Haram is there. From, so from a spiritual perspective, it's superior. From an emotional perspective, this is home. Right? There's so much to connect them to Masjid al-Haram. But when they, when they got to Mecca, as the Prophet ﷺ got there, a man stood up and he says, Ya Rasulullah, inni nadartu lillahi in Allahu alayka Mecca an usalliya fi bayt al-Maqdisi rak'atayn. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I made an oath to Allah that if Allah ever gives us back, if He opens Masjid al-Haram for us, then I'm going to go pray two rak'ahs in Masjid al-Aqsa. The Prophet ﷺ told him, Salliha huna, just pray here. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to go pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. So the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, you can pray right here. Then he said, Shatnuka idhan, just do what you want. The, the burden is on you then. You made an oath to Allah, you have to do it. But that was their connection, right? That, that's what the Prophet ﷺ fostered inside of them, as far as the love for Masjid al-Aqsa was concerned. And you have a, a weak hadith here, but I want to mention it just to show you something. All right? There's a weaker hadith from Umm Salama radiallahu anha. In Abu Dawood, that the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever puts on ihram from Jerusalem and makes his way to Hajj or Umrah will be forgiven for all of his sins, وَوَجَبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ And paradise is guaranteed for him. Now the hadith is not the strongest. In fact, Abu Dawood narrates the hadith and he says it's not the strongest. But he says, may Allah have mercy on Waqi' ibn Jarrah. Waqi' is the teacher of three of the four Imams. He said, may Allah have mercy on him. He went all the way to Masjid al-Aqsa he put on his ihram and he made Umrah from Masjid al-Aqsa all the way to Mecca, all the way to the Kaaba. And Allahu alam, if this is again the route of Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? So it's not a sunnah. I don't, want to, I don't want a bunch of people now starting to go and put on ihram in Jerusalem. But just to show you again the love, the attachment that they had. Then you have another narration which has been narrated multiple times by Abu Dawood, by Ahmad ibn Majah. Uh, it's, it's weaker in its chain, but the strongest narration is in Ibn Majah that Maymuna bin Sa'id, she, asked, she said to the Prophet ﷺ, أَفْتِنَا فِي بَيْتِ المقدس. You know, give us, tell us about Bayt al-Maqdis, tell us what's so special about Jerusalem. قَالَ أَرْضُ الْمَحْشَرِ وَالْمَنْشَرِ He said that it is the land of resurrection and gathering. We're all going to go there. Everyone will be gathered in Masjid al-Aqsa. Then she said to the Prophet ﷺ, she said, Ya Rasulullah, it's always full of war. It's, there, there, it's never, it's not at peace. So, what should we do? The Prophet ﷺ says, "Utuhu fasallu fi." Go to it and pray there. He says, "Fa inlam tuhu wa tusallu fi." And if you cannot go there and pray there, listen to this. Be- these words are really beautiful. He says, "Fa baathu bizaitin yusraju fi qanadini." 
He said, then at least send some oil to light up its lamps. You can't go there and pray, that's fine. But don't disconnect yourself. You can't go there and pray, send some oil to light up its lamps. You know, subhanAllah, you think about that, that there is, connect yourself even economically to it. Now even the scholars, again, if they say the hadith is weak, all of the scholars say that it is a part of the religion, that it is part of our fiqh, it's part of our practice. That the Muslims connect themselves, that to send oil for the lamps of Masjid al-Aqsa or to contribute to it. And as Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَيُقْصَدُ بِذَلِكْ أَيْضًا تَقْدِيمِ الْعَوْنِ الْمَادِي لِلْإِسْهَامِ فِي إِمَارَةِ أَوْ إِصْلَاحِ أَوْ ضَاعِهِ He said it means sending, you know, even money to repair it, sending money to take care of it, just anything to support it, anything to help Masjid al-Aqsa. It's a, it's a part of our religion that we connect ourselves uh, to it. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is just something that's ironic. Allah refers to Masjid al-Aqsa in the Qur'an as a zaytun. Watini was zaytun. It's the olives, right? The, the place of olive trees. And what is it that's being robbed from the Palestinian people constantly other than their homes? They go and they destroy all of these olive trees. SubhanAllah. So connecting ourselves to that land is something that is a part of our religion, right? And the Prophet Wasallam, he encouraged that and he, and, and he told them to connect themselves even in that way. Even in that way. You can't go there and pray. Don't stop making dua for it. Don't stop lobbying for it. Don't stop spreading awareness about it. You know, to me, that, that's an injunction for, for, for BDS, for boycotting as well. Because, you know, if, if, if it's part of the sunnah to send some oil to be put in its lamps, then it's also part of the sunnah to withhold from the oppressor, to withhold from the occupier and the one who's oppressing that, the people of that land or occupying that land. It's a part of connecting ourselves to the, to the place. And so the Prophet is telling them, no, don't, don't stop. Don't give up on it. It still has a place in your religion. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he also informs the companions as he's dying. And this is powerful because it's spot on. Awf ibn Malik عنه, says that after the battle of Tabuk, he says the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in his tent. And then he called me and he said, count six things before the day of judgment. The first one, my death. The second one, the conquest of Bayt al-Maqdis. The conquest of Jerusalem, that it will come to us. SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, right after I die, Jerusalem will come to us. And there was no effort, no plan, there is nothing going on. There is no engagement even with the Roman Empire at that point from the Muslims. But the Prophet ﷺ is saying that after I pass, Bayt al-Maqdis will come uh, to the believers. Now I want to give you guys a little bit of context as to what Jerusalem looked like at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The Romans and the Persians are the two empires that are fighting each other, they're killing each other. Everyone essentially is either an observer or taking a side. You're either with the Romans or you're with the Persians. Everyone in between is just siding with one of those two empires. Now, the Persians, the Romans had the upper hand on the Persians for some time. And then the Persians destroyed the Roman Empire. They started to fight the Roman Empire quite effectively. And it was in the year 613 that Damascus, Damascus, now the largest city at that time in Syria was Hems. So that was actually bigger than Damascus. It wasn't, that was the capital of the Roman, of the Byzantines, right? Hems was their headquarters. Damascus was the second biggest city. Damascus was taken in the year 613. That's three years after the Prophet ﷺ receives revelation. In the year 614, the Persians surrounded Jerusalem. Kisra and his army surrounded Jerusalem. And they massacred 90,000 Christians. They desecrated the Holy Sepulchre which is where the original cross is, which the Christians believe Isa Islam was crucified on, they stole the cross and they even took it with them to Persia. So they completely destroyed uh, the Christians in Jerusalem. They occupied Jerusalem. Now here's the thing. Who do you think the Jews were going to uh, be allied with when it came to this battle? They would ally themselves with the Persians. Why? Because the Christians have been persecuting them this entire time. So they hated the Christians. So the Jews allied themselves with the Persians. Okay? The Muslims allied themselves with the Romans. Why did they ally themselves with the Romans? Because Quraysh in Mecca allied themselves with the Persians. The pagan Arabs were allied with the Persians. All right? And what they were doing, because the Persians were polytheists and the Romans were Christians, they were comparing the Muslims to the Christians. And the Muslims felt, a, you know, felt an attachment to the Christians because of Abyssinia, for example, where Najashi took them in. The Abyssinians were part, you know, part of the Roman Empire. They were, they were connected to them because it was part of that entire movement, right? So the Muslims felt an attachment to the Christians because they were muwahideen. They were people that worshipped one God. And the Quraysh 
We're taunting the Muslims and saying, you see what the Persians did to the Christians? We're going to do that to you. That it's coming to you as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed what? Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat al Rum fi adna al ard wa hum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaghlibun fi bid'i sinim. Allah said, You just wait. In three to nine years, Allah said, bid'i sinim. Three to nine years, the Romans will defeat the Persians. And that sounded crazy at the time. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was being mocked, Abu Bakr made a bet with one of the non Muslims. Now, back then, gambling wasn't haram yet, it's still in Mecca. And there really is no risk factor here because it's revelation. So, that, you know, go ahead and bet whatever you want, right? Because Allah will fulfill that promise. And that would be a sign for the believers as well, that just as Allah would give the Christians victory over the Persians, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give the Muslims victory over their enemies. So what you had now, as the Jews allied themselves with the Persians, um, the Persians, when they took over Jerusalem, the deal that they made with the Jews is that they would let them rebuild their temple. And they'd let them have Jerusalem and worship freely and things of that sort. So this would be the first time the Jews would have their opportunity to come back to Jerusalem and to make a third attempt at the Temple of Solomon. Now, uh, Heraclius, who is the ruler of the Romans, Heraclius starts to gather the Christians once again, and they fight back and they defeat the Persians. And in fact, they defeated the Persians the same year as the Muslims beat the polytheists in Badr. So subhanAllah, it was like a... It was completely correlated, what Allah mentioned in Surah Rum, just because that alliance was made by the polytheists, in fact. Now here's the thing, the Romans don't care about Masjid al-Aqsa. The Christians have no attachment to Masjid al-Aqsa, they're not fighting over it. What did they do? Obviously they killed the Jews again, and what they did is they destroyed their third attempt at the Temple of Solomon, and they made Masjid al-Aqsa a dumpster. Can you imagine, subhanAllah, they destroyed any structure on top of it, and they made it the dump of the Romans in Jerusalem. Now when did the Prophet ﷺ go to Masjid al-Aqsa? When it was under Persian rule. Isra al Mi'raj took place when it was under Persian rule. So it wasn't the dumpster yet because that came after Medina, after the Hijrah. So when the Prophet ﷺ is in Medina, Abu Sufyan has a very interesting thing that he narrates. Abu Sufyan was with a group of people from Mecca and he says this was during the time of Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So the non-Muslims from Mecca and the, and the Muslims in Medina, they had their treaty, they had their, 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 uh, their covenant, so we could travel, we could go on our trade routes. He said, we went to Jerusalem. While we were in Jerusalem, Heraclius was visiting Jerusalem from Hems. Heraclius went to sleep in Jerusalem, and at night, while he was sleeping, he saw a dream that the head, the leader of the circumcised people would conquer them. Now, here's the thing, they thought that was the Jews. So Heraqal, he woke up and he called the dream interpreters and he called people and said, what is this dream that I saw? They said, oh, if it's just the Jews, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you know, we've got them in check. We've persecuted them. We've killed them. We don't have to worry about them. As Heraqal was thinking that, the letter came from the Prophet ﷺ, inviting him to Islam. And he panicked because he knew that this was the fulfillment of his dream. Right? And when he came to know that the Prophet ﷺ was upholding the, the law of Abraham, because that's, that was the code word, that was the terminology, right? the circumcised people, he was upholding the law of Ibrahim ﷺ, he realized this was different. So he finds, he says, is there anyone from Arabia that's here? So they said Abu Sufyan and his people are traveling through Jerusalem right now. He says, bring them here. He says, who amongst you, you know, knows the situation of Mecca most? Bring them forward. He stands Abu Sufyan in the front. He stands the rest of them behind him. He says, I'm going to ask you questions about this man, Muhammad Sallallahu And if you lie, then I'm telling your companions, you better tell me he's lying. And if they tell me you're lying, then I'm going to cut your head off. So you have to tell me the truth. I know you don't like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi but you're going to have to tell me the truth about it. So he stands him there and he asks him all these questions. And Abu Sufyan has to give him all these amazing answers about the Prophet Sallallahu How honest he is, how noble he is, that his religion is increasing, that his followers find peace in their hearts when they come to Islam. You know, all these amazing things. It's a long conversation in Bukhari. And Abu Sufyan says, Wallahi, had it not been for the fact that I thought one of my companions would have betrayed me, I would have lied about the Prophet But Because I, I was a non-Muslim at the time. He said, but I couldn't do anything about it. He said, then when we left, as we walked out from Heraqal, when we walked out from Heraculus, he picked up the letter that the Prophet sent him. And he started to cry loudly. So Abu Sufyan said, as I walked out from that meeting, I said, Muhammad is going to conquer these people too. We thought he was just going to conquer Mecca and Medina and these areas. His kingdom is going to spread all the way here to Jerusalem. Like, so I knew at that point that the Prophet would eventually 
his message would come here as well, that he was going to conquer these people as well. Now, Heraclius had a soft spot for Islam. And this is a, a very brief summary of Heraclius. He tested Islam with his guards and with his patriarchs and stuff like that. He kind of floated the idea of accepting the Prophet ﷺ. And when he saw that the people were completely averse to it, and that they would depose him, that they'd get rid of him if he dared accept the Prophet ﷺ, he then said, okay, fine. We're not going to accept him. We're going to fight against him. So Heraclius, subhanAllah, is actually a tragedy. Heraclius is a tragedy. Because he believed in the Prophet ﷺ. He had a soft spot for Islam. And you know, maybe one day I'll get to teach a class about it because he's really a fascinating character because he, he tried to make Christianity more agnostic, more accepting. SubhanAllah, he, he took some steps even theologically to make it more embracing. And he knew that the Prophet ﷺ was a prophet. But he rejected because he was afraid of his kingdom. Now why am I giving you this entire context? Because after the Prophet ﷺ dies, the Muslims are at war with the Byzantines, they're fighting, and they just won the Battle of Yarmouk, which is one of the most momentous occasions in Islamic history, if you read about the Battle of Yarmouk in Jordan. And now the, it's coming to the frontiers of Jerusalem. And it's the year 637, and Heracl, Her, Her, uh, Heraclius makes an offer. He says, listen, we don't want any bloodshed. He says, we will give you the keys to the city of Jerusalem. He said on one condition. He said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he said, your commander, the leader of your, the great Umar, because at that, Umar has a worldwide reputation, عنه, everyone knows how great he is. He said, I want him to come and take the key himself. He has to come take the keys of the city himself. We will give it over, we'll hand it over, no bloodshed, we're not going to fight. We'll give you the keys and we'll put on a ceremony and we'll treat you guys well. So, they go, you know, this message gets to Umar عنه, and subhanAllah, some of the patriarchs, they actually told Amr ibn As and some of the Muslims that Umar was described as the man who will take Jerusalem. That the descriptions of Umar, a huge man, right, a, a man of justice and so on and so forth, he fits the description. So we want him to come take it. Now when it gets to Umar anhu, he's in Medina. The Khalifa should not leave Medina, okay? Because it's dangerous to leave your fort, right? And it just didn't, ha it, it, was, it was unprecedented at that point. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he gets the companions together, he says, what do you guys think? Some of them say you should stay, it's a plot. Some of them say, no, you should go, go ahead and take the keys. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored you with this. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, eventually he takes the advice of Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali said, no, you should go. If this is going to bring Al-Quds under our rule and we're not going to have bloodshed and it's going to show a certain haiba, a certain awe of the Muslims and so on and so forth, you should go. So Umar sets out from Medina to Jerusalem, his first time leaving Medina as Khalifa in the year 637 after Isa salam, and Her Heraclius puts on this lavish ceremony. He rolls out a, a carpet, the red carpet of that time. It spanned for two kilometers and he lined up his guards throughout, right, to accept Umar radiallahu anhu. He invited the patriarchs to give him the keys of Jerusalem. I mean, he set it up, right? Uh, Amr ibn As is there. Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah is there. So some of the greatest companions are standing there waiting for Umar to come to Jerusalem. Now what happens on the way? This is a famous story. Umar radiallahu anhu had one cloth, one garment. All right, that's number one. Number two, he was traveling with a servant. And they had one camel. So Umar said, I'll make a deal with you. You ride half the time, I'll ride half the time. SubhanAllah, the Khalifa, the most powerful man in the world at this point. So they're riding and... As they're getting close to Jerusalem, it's the servant's turn, it's not Umar's turn, right? So Umar radiallahu anhu is the one who's pulling the camel. And to make matters even worse, he already had 18 stitches in his garment. To make matters even worse, he falls into a mud puddle. So Umar is covered in dirt and mud, and he's got a servant on the camel, and they're getting close to Jerusalem, and they know what's waiting for them. So the servant says to Umar, Ya Amir al muminin should we switch now? I mean, it's not going to look right. He said, nope, it's your turn, it's justice. Right? I took this much time, your time is not up, so it has to stay that way. So they're waiting and they're all lined up and people are looking out their windows, waiting to see the greatest man in the world, the most powerful man in the world. And they see Umar radiallahu anhu with a camel covered in dirt with a servant on the camel. And some of the Muslims are just like, oh God, this is embarrassing. Right? Abu Ubaid radiallahu anhu, he goes out to Umar and he meets him as he's getting on that carpet. He says to him, come on, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. You could have dressed better, you could have prepared yourself better for the occasion. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he, he, he pushes the chest of Abu Ubaidah. And he says, I wish someone other than you would have said this. And he said the famous words. He said, listen, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ We are a people that Allah dignified through Islam. 
We don't need people's validation. If we seek it through other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us. We don't need it. We don't need them to think highly of us. We're going to do what the Prophet left us on. We're going to carry ourselves with that etiquette. If they don't like it, that's their problem. Now what ended up happening? They were in complete awe. These people are used to pompous rulers in this place. They were in complete awe of the humility of Umar ta'ala anhu, and the people fell in love with Umar ta'ala anhu. Now what does Umar anhu do? First order of business is to clean up Masjid al-Aqsa because it's covered in dirt now, it's a dumpster. So he goes to Masjid al-Aqsa and he cleans up, he and the companions, they start to clean up Masjid al-Aqsa and he asked uh, Ka'b ibn al-Ahbar. Ka'b ibn al-Ahbar was a Jewish rabbi that converted to Islam. You know, he said, where should, we, where should we set up the masjid? Now, in the middle of Masjid al-Aqsa, there's this rock, or there's this rocky area, right? And it's right in the center, and that's believed to be where Sulaiman al-Islam established the temple. It's right in the middle, right? So when they clean it all up, and, and they decide, you know, where are we going to pray? He asked Ka'b ibn al-Ahbar. Ka'b ibn al-Ahbar says, we should pray behind the rock. And Umar sensed from that, that he, he felt a reverence towards that rock. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, that must be your Jewish influence speaking. He said, we're going to pray in front of the rock. <laughs> we're not going to honor this rock. We're going to pray in front of it. There's nothing special about the rock. It's okay. Maybe it is the place Sulaiman al-Islam established, but let's pray the closest to the Qibla as we can. Now, as I said, that entire area is Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay? So Umar goes to the very front of it, and he, leads, he prays his salah there, and that's what's known today as Masjid al-Aqsa, Masjid al-Qibali. Now it's all Masjid al-Aqsa, but the green dome, this one, which is epically painted, mashallah, all right, the green dome is actually where Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu led the salah. Now all of it is Masjid al-Aqsa. It's all Masjid al-Aqsa. But the best place to pray in Masjid al-Aqsa is where Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, prayed, because that's where, that, that, that is the sunnah in that regard, and that's the closest to the qibla and so on and so forth. But if you prayed anywhere in that entire area, you're technically praying in Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay. Now the dome was left empty for a very long time. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, the rock was left uncovered. Some of the people say that's where the Prophet ﷺ ascended. There's really nothing to confirm that. And the, the dome was built on top of it. The gold dome was built on top of it by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So it came years later, decades later, right, just to mark the entire sanctuary, to be right in the center. And it's a pretty beautiful sight, right? When you see the, the middle of, of this entire sanctuary is that beautiful gold dome. And Sulaiman the Magnificent, not Sulaiman the Prophet ﷺ, Sulaiman the Magnificent, he beautified it even more. So he, he put a lot into uh, the gold dome, into what's known as the Dome of the Rock. Now something else happens as they reach Jerusalem. You can imagine that this is a very emotional time for them. They're basically fulfilling the dream of the Prophet ﷺ. They've been praying towards this place before. Umar was one of the people that prayed towards this place. They knew this place. They loved this place. They made vows with this place, right? And now they're finally here, and it's the first time they're there. And they know they're standing in the same place that prophets have stood before, that angels have stood before. So one of the people that was there was Bilal radiallahu anhu. Bilal, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, he could not stand to be in Medina anymore because he'd missed the Prophet ﷺ too much. He couldn't give adhan anymore. Because every time he said, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, he'd break down into tears. So he begged Abu Bakr, he said, let me go out and fight uh, in Asham. Let me just go out with the troops that go towards Asham. Let me just spend the rest of my life like that. I don't want to be here in Medina anymore. I can't handle it. So Umar radiallahu anhu, when he uh, gets the companions together for their first salah in Masjid al-Aqsa, he asks Bilal, can you give the adhan? And Bilal radiallahu anhu says no. <laughs> and Umar and the companions start to beg him like, please, we want to hear your adhan again. We haven't heard your adhan now for over a decade. We're talking 14 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu we want to hear your adhan, the way we used to hear it when the Prophet ﷺ was alive. So Bilal finally agreed, and Bilal stands up to give the adhan, and Al-Waqdi says all of the companions were weeping loudly, because they were remembering the adhan in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. They were remembering the Messenger ﷺ. So even as they're in Masjid al-Aqsa, they all start crying, and they forget themselves, because they remember the Prophet ﷺ. And Bilal radiallahu anhu, as he says, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, he starts to cry again like he used to in Medina. And this is where this momentous occasion, the first time Bilal calls Adhan after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, is in Masjid al-Aqsa for the first Salah. So they pray, and then uh, the patriarch, he comes, and his name was Safranius. Safranius. So if you actually search him, he's a fascinating character. S-O-P-H-R-O-N-I-U-S. Search this man. He's interesting. He's the patriarch of Jerusalem. 
and he admired Umar radiallahu anhu. He looked at Umar and he said, this is a noble man. He's Muslim, he's not Christian, but he's a noble man. Now, Safranius was actually, he's one of the few people that became a saint in the East Orthodox Church and in the Catholic Church. That's very rare in Christian theology and Christian history. Very noble man, a very good man. He tells Umar radiallahu anhu, let me give you a tour of the city. So he takes Umar radiallahu anhu to the Holy Sepulchre, he takes him to the Church of Nativity, he takes him to all of these different places, and he shows him these areas. When they go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Adhan of Asr comes in. Okay, so Asr time comes in. This is the church which houses the, the cross that Isa a.s. was supposedly crucified on. And the patriarch, he says, look, why don't you just pray here? It'll be an honor for us. This is his interfaith gesture, right? Just pray here, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. This will be a nice, this is a nice way to bring us together, right? To show that we're all on the same page. Go ahead and pray here. Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, no. He said, because I know my people. I know how Muslims are. He said, if I pray here, generations later, Muslims are going to come and say, this is a masjid and not a church. He said, it's better that I go out and I pray somewhere else. So he literally stepped outside of the church and prayed there. And subhanAllah, lo and behold, generations later they came and they made it masjid Umar. <laughs> So Umar radiallahu anhu knew what he was talking about, that I know how Muslims think. They're going to say, Umar prayed here and they're going to take your church. Let me make it easier for you guys so that we don't complicate things in the future. And, and he draws up one of the most beautiful contracts. And you can actually look it up. The covenant of Umar, Al-Umariya. The, the, literally the Umar covenant where he makes this peace treaty with the Christians, allowing them to practice. Now interestingly enough, the Christians don't want the Jews back. The Christians tell him that, We've had enough war with these people and we fought with them. We don't want them to come back and live with us. They're trying to make that a condition on Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But Umar would be the first one to bring 70 Jewish families to Jerusalem after, he, after it came to the Muslims to reside in Jerusalem once again. So literally after 300 plus years, it was Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu who invited them into the city once again to be able to live there. Now let's fast forward. I told you guys that there's an hadith that just brings us all together very beautifully for all of us but before then just to make a very important point Umar entered into that city without a single drop of blood spilling Umar entered into that city the Muslims entered into that city without spilling a single drop of blood fast forward to the year 1099 the crusaders enter into Jerusalem they massacre 70,000 Muslims in Masjid al-Aqsa. They line them up and they kill them in Masjid al-Aqsa. They set the synagogues and the churches, the Eastern churches, because remember, they're from the Catholic Church. They set the Eastern churches in the synagogue on fire. The people were hiding inside of there. They set them on fire and burned them alive. They wrote in their diaries, the Crusaders, that in Jerusalem, the blood was coming up to our horses' knees. We flooded the city with blood. SubhanAllah. And they wrote about I can't tell you the things that are said in these Crusader diaries. They are so despicable. I'm talking about, they, t they actually roasted children's bodies and corpses. These people did the most grievous things, all in the name of Christianity, all in the name of Christ. The most grievous war crimes, if you will, that are known to man, that are known in history. They did it in the name of Christ in Jerusalem, in Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is important to note, they, they had a group by the name of, and you can read about them historically, they're called the Knights Temp Templar. The Knights Templar are known as the Order of Solomon's Temple. Once again, Solomon's Temple. The common theme is Solomon's Temple is under the Dome of the Rock. It's in that area, we have to take it back. Now, the Templar, the Knights Templar, they were a Christian group, and they were formed in the 1100s, and they went to King Baldwin II after they took Jerusalem, and they brought it under Christian rule. And they proposed, to, they proposed to him that they take over Al-Aqsa. Now he calls what's known as the Council of Nablus in the year 1120. And they turned Masjid Al-Aqsa into their headquarters. And so Masjid Al-Aqsa became the Knights Templar headquarters. They put a cross on top of it. And it was from there that they put their Grand Masters. And by the way, there's a very strong connection from Freemasonry to the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar was only a 200-year-old movement. The Christians eventually got sick of them and fought them and arrested them. Okay? The Freemasonry movement is tied to the Knights Templar, even the same rankings and orders and so on and so forth. They established the Masjid al-Aqsa as their headquarters, and from there, they renamed it Solomon's Temple. So Masjid al-Aqsa was officially renamed Solomon's Temple, and it was there that they started to, uh, that they started to dig, that they started to reestablish what they thought was Solomon's Temple. And subhanAllah, this is very interesting because 
I mean, just imagine 90 years. 90 years. We can't, we can't fathom that. We see videos of, 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 of settlers and, and soldiers committing crimes inside Masjid al-Aqsa, and we just, it disgusts us. 90 years, Masjid al-Aqsa. The last thing that happened with Muslims was 70,000 people were killed. It was desecrated. They threw all types of filth in there. They put a cross on top of it. They did every unimaginable crime that you could possibly imagine in that masjid. Salahuddin, rahimahullah, comes back in the year 1187. And in the year 1187, he comes back and he enters Jerusalem on the night of the 27th of Rajab, which according to many is the, uh, the night of Al-Isra' wal Mi'raj. So the same night, Salahuddin is entering into Jerusalem once again. The people think he's going to do to them what they did to the Muslims. So some people committed suicide, subhanAllah, just anticipating what would happen to them when Salahuddin got a hold of them as he, as he laid Jerusalem under siege. And Salah is, is standing on the outskirts and subhanAllah, he is anticipating. This is the moment he's been waiting for, to get into Jerusalem. And instead of killing people and massacring people, you know what he does? He grants amnesty, treats the prisoners well. He sends ice water to the commanders. He assures them safety. He even says some of the Christians can continue living here. The ones that don't pose a threat, they can continue to live here. You know what he does with the cross that was on top of Masjid al-Aqsa and all the Christian relics? He takes them all and he puts them in a chest. <laughs> and he hands it over to the patriarch. SubhanAllah, what a stark difference. Once again, Salahuddin enters with nobility. The way that Umar anhu enters, assuring the people, recognizing the sanctity of that land and assuring the people that they will be treated well. That we're not here to kill people. We're not, we're not the ones that oppress. We're not the ones that are trying to make this place exclusive to Muslims. We are we are in our nature. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us is a very tolerant, a very tolerant way of life, right? And it's proven that other religions only flourished in Jerusalem under Muslim rule. It never happens any other way. Under Umar, under Salah al-Din, and Salah al-Din brought the Jews back after they were expelled by the Crusaders. And then the Ottoman Empire for almost 400 years. Religious communities were able to flourish under the Ottoman Empire. And what that shows you is that this is the way that the Muslims have always conducted. This is a refutation right away that the Muslims want to turn Jerusalem into some sort of bloodbath. No, we recognize the sanctity of that place. We love that masjid. We love that land. We know what that land is. No one, no one wants to do anything with that land except restore it to the way that it was. You know, there's a very beautiful conversation. Richard the Lionheart, he asked Salah al-Din, he said, what is Jerusalem to you? Now in, in the, what was it, the, what was the name of that uh, movie? Uh, the Crusades movie that they had that came out. Kingdom of Heaven, right? In Kingdom of Heaven, he says nothing, and then he walks away, and then he comes back and says everything. I know that's epic, but that's not actually what happens, okay? <laughs> Salah al-Din, when Richard Lionheart asked him, what is Al-Quds to you? What is Jerusalem to you? And he, he responded to him in his exact words. He says, it is to us as it is to you. It's even more important to us since it's the site of our Prophet Sallallahu journey, his, his, his journey to, uh, his night journey, and it's the place where the people will assemble on the Day of Judgment, and he said, so do not imagine for a moment that we will ever give it up. Don't imagine for a moment. It means a lot to us, subhanAllah. And you know what Salah al-Din brought with him? He brought with him a custom manbar. His, his mentor, his predecessor, Nur al-Din, built a pulpit that he said, one day when we get Palestine back, we're going to put this pulpit there. So Salah al-Din had it brought with him because Nur al-Din fought off the crusaders for all those years. Salah al-Din brought it with him and he put it in Masjid al-Aqsa. <laughs> and he stood up and he gave khutbah. And it's a very beautiful khutbah. Look up the khutbah in your own time of Salah al-Din in Masjid al-Aqsa. He literally gives almost what I gave about virtues of Jerusalem and so on and so forth. Praising Allah, praising the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, praising this opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them to be amongst those people. And this is very powerful. That that's the way that he enters into that city. And you know, as we see it under oppression today, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, and this is a hadith from Abu Umama, and it's an authentic hadith, and it's a powerful hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, لا يزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين على الحق لعدوهم قاهرين لا يضرهم من خذلهم حتى يأتيهم أمر الله وهم كذلك قالوا يا رسول الله وأينهم قال بالبيت المقدس وأكنافي بيت المقدس. The Prophet ﷺ said. There will always be a group from my ummah that will be upon the truth. Their enemy cannot do away with them, 
Subhanallah, this is powerful. He said, it will not affect them when other people betray them. When the rest of the Muslims turn their backs on them, when the nations and the rulers and the leaders that should be doing something about it turn their backs on this group of people, they stay firm on the truth. They keep doing what they do. Their resistance is by existing, by still going to the masjid, by refusing to leave. You can do whatever you want to them. They will not give it up. SubhanAllah. These people go to the masjid with a the, with the very likely possibility of being attacked all the time. And they want to go, and even more of them want to go. You can't stop them. And the Prophet said they would stay that way until the Day of Judgment. No one would be able to stop them. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, where are they? He said, in Bayt al-Maqdis, in Jerusalem, and around Jerusalem. Now I told you guys the amazing narration that I'll bring this all together with. The Prophet ﷺ went from Mecca to Jerusalem. Ibrahim ﷺ went from Jerusalem to Mecca. These are the first two masjids that have ever been established. This place on, on the Day of Judgment Bayt al-Maqdis, this area of Asham, is the place of assembly. We are all resurrected there in Asham. All of us are resurrected there in Asham. How many of us have made Hajj and Umrah? But how many of us have desired and longed for that moment to pray in Mazal al-Aqsa? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates. He says, Tuhsharu al-Ka'batu ila Bayt al-Maqdis. He said, on the Day of Judgment, the Ka'bah will be brought to Jerusalem. The Ka'bah will be brought to Jerusalem متعلقاً بأستارها كل من حج واعتمر He said everyone that made Hajj or Umrah will be hanging on to the cloth of the Kaaba as it's brought to Jerusalem and it's sat there where Masjid Al-Aqsa is bringing together these two first Masjids connecting all of the faiths, SubhanAllah We're there and inshaAllah Ta'ala if we made Umrah or Hajj may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala write down for us and accepted Umrah and accepted Hajj multiple accepted Umrahs and Hajjs we're holding on to the cloth of the Kaaba as it comes to Jerusalem. So whether people oppress and keep people out or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always has a plan for that place. That place is guaranteed success. It's guaranteed to thrive. The Prophet said faith remains there and it is a place on the Day of Judgment that is a place of success and felicity. And it's ironic that Allah says in the Qur'an, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُهُ وَسَعَ فِي خَرَابِهَا how unjust are those who prevent the name of Allah from being mentioned in his mosques and strive towards their destruction. That ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, according to many of the Mufassireen, particularly referred to Masjid Al-Aqsa. It's general, but it particularly referred to Masjid Al-Aqsa. How cruel of a person would you have to be? How sick do people have to be to stop the name of Allah from being mentioned in this place? To stop people from praying in this place? And you might be told over and over again, as we're told in the news over and over again, that there is nothing that's happening over there, that, that, that Israel is maintaining the status quo, that, you know, that Muslims are being allowed to pray and so on and so forth. But slowly, 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 it keeps getting taken away. It keeps on, restrictions keep being added, people keep on being prevented. You have to be a certain age to go, you have to have this card, you have to have that card. Legislation, racist legislation is constantly being passed to stop people from being able to pray there, right? Attacks. Videos come out in the age of social media of people going and throwing pigs at people while they're praying. Throwing rocks at them and hitting them while they're praying. We're not the ones inciting. We're lobbying for this place to be a place of peace because that's what Muslims are about. We're not, we're not the ones that are being insightful when we point out all the aggressions that take place in that place. And again, because a human life is more precious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than even Masjid al-Aqsa, than even al-Ka'bah, even Baytullah al-Haram, we should strive to make sure that innocent people are protected. And that's, our, that's beyond any noble sanctuary. But knowing that that place, Masjid al-Aqsa, what it means to us, now that we know what it meant to the Prophets of Allah, what it meant to the Prophets of Allah, what it meant to his companions, all of us should have that connection to it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow each and every single one of us to be granted the opportunity to pray two rak'ahs there in a liberated Masjid al-Aqsa without any form of oppression, with no ulterior motive, with no other intention except to be forgiven for our sins and to honor the place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself blessed and sanctified. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be productive and to allow us to strive in ways that are, that, that, that are good, to strive in ways that are good to, to help the innocent around the world, to help uh, the people in Palestine, to help all of them that are in this situation and to make us amongst those that believe in our dua and that believe in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised while still giving us the opportunity, inshallah ta'ala, to be able 
uh, to, to pray there and to be able, inshallah ta'ala, to one day return to there. Alhamdulillah, as I said to you all, the story of Jibreel is now out. I worked very, very hard on that class. It was my favorite class. I think it's my favorite class of all time uh, to have taught. I'm very happy that it's now on Bayna TV, alhamdulillah. So inshallah ta'ala, I hope that you all find it very beneficial and it connects you to the Prophet ﷺ because at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is connect ourselves to Allah and His Messenger ﷺ. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan to all of you for joining. Inshallah ta'ala, we hope to see you in our future webcasts as well. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alh